So, so just to start with, I want to make note that my email address is up here. And one of the important things about working at Ultragenics is that we are allowed to use some of our time to help people in the community. So if you have any questions about gene therapy or things like that, please feel free to reach out to me. And if I can't help you, I will put you into contact with someone that probably can. And, and this is also at the end, I think, so you, you can get it there. So just disclaimers, I, I'm an employee of Ultragenics, and the opinions and conclusions made today are my own and not Ultragenics. Okay, so I wanted to really take sort of a step back and really just talk about what is a gene before we even talk about what therapy of a gene is. And so if you think about just a single cell, oops, in your body, one cell has three billion bases, and really it's six billion because it's times two. And that is all compacted into your cell, into a chromosome. And if you sort of magnify that or zoom in, it gets into this DNA structure that's a little less compact, less compact in a histone, less compact as a nucleosome, and then what you have is actually a gene. And a gene is a section of DNA that is ascribed some sort of function, and I'll talk about this in a second. And then if you zoom in just a little bit more, the gene is made up of nucleotides. So of those three billion bases, there's a certain set of bases in a gene that encode that. And those are made of G's, C's, A's, and T's sort of the shorthand that we use. And so this has, these all have specific locations. These encode typically overt functions. And it's important to recognize that alterations in genes can, but do not always cause dysfunction. So a lot of us, in fact, everyone in this room has mutations throughout their genome. It's quite normal, but most of those, as I'll show you in a second, are silent. They cause really no harm. Um, and, and we're completely unaware of them. Um, but sometimes they cause other types of mutations which can have effects. And I work with two patient groups, the Coalition to Cure CHD2 and the Cohen, Re uh, the Cohen Syndrome Research Foundation. And I just wanted to highlight their two genes because it's important that you know each of your genes and where they're located. So CHD2 is located on chromosome 15 and its address is 15Q26.1. And the Cohen syndrome gene is VPS13B. It's located on chromosome 8. Its actual address is 8Q22.2. And so that's really important, if you don't know that, to find out where it is. So when you go talk to researchers, you can go to them and say, here, this is where it is. You can pull up the bases and those sorts of things. So this might be a little basic, but just as a reminder of why we're trying to do gene therapy and going back to the gene, DNA encodes, the DNA that you have encodes for mRNA. And I know that um, you know, there was a forum yesterday on mRNA therapy and what mRNA does. But what mRNA does is it serves as a mediate between DNA and protein. And the protein is what actually has the function. And so that's important. So the three billion bases encode about 20,000 genes that have discrete cellular functions. And those are used by our cells and by our bodies for our everyday existence, and you have really honestly no idea that it's going on. And these functions are facilitated by pathways utilizing that DNA, RNA, protein pathway. And examples of some of these functions include, this is just some of the many, many, many examples. Processing metabolites, muscle contraction, DNA replication, movement of other proteins, activation or inhibition of other proteins, interactions with proteins, the list is very, very long. And this is another thing that for your disease, you're gonna to want to understand at some point what's going on so you can understand sort of what the modality or mechanism of action needs to be for the treatment you're seeking. And so with gene therapy specifically, we're, oops, I keep doing this. We seek to replace or repair the specific pathways and molecules when the typical function is not being provided due to the mutations. So what kind of mutations do you typically see? So the way I like to look at this is sort of like a sentence. And so on the top left is what's called, is actually if I back up just one second, so what you can see up here is you have the DNA, AGTC. That then fits to an mRNA. It's basically the same except for the, um, the T is replaced by a, a U, or an A is replaced by the U. And then that encodes for a protein or an amino acid. 
And so that amino acid is actually what gives you a word. So you can think of the DNA as being the alphabet, the mRNA is an extension of the alphabet, and then the protein is a word. And so if you look up here, oops, the sentence is supposed to be the cat ate the rat. In this case, there was a mutation where it's still the cat ate the rat, but it's a different letter. But since we know what it means, it's okay. But for a substitution mutation, this means that sometimes the meaning of this sentence changes. And now it is because we have substituted in a lysine for a glutamine, the hat ate the rat. And so the sentence completely changes. And in the context of a protein, this can completely change or abrogate its function. For an insertion, now what we've done is completely put the sentence out of frame. And so as you can see, the rest of the sentence no longer even makes sense. And then for a deletion, it's, it's pretty much the opposite, right? So you're still out of frame, you just took a letter out. And again, the sentence no longer makes sense. And in the context of a protein, insertions or deletions sometimes have no effect, depending on where they are in the sequence, and sometimes they have very strong effects. And it really depends on where in the protein and what function that part of the protein has. And knowing that really helps you understand the cause and the underlying mechanism of the disease that you're studying. And that's really important for understanding which modality might be best for treating that. So what is the ba basic definition of gene therapy? It's the treatment or prevention of a genetic disease via introduction of a genetic material expected to provide a necessary function. I know that's a lot of words, but basically, if you think about it in the simplest terms, we're taking the known gene that has the native function and we're t putting it in a cell and telling it to make the native protein. We're just trying to replace it. So there are a couple different approaches very basic approaches that you can take to gene therapy. I'm only gonna cover the first two, and then Amy's gonna cover the last one. And these are addition, so you can take a gene and add it back. Inhibition, if you have a gene that's not working properly or it's overexpressed, you can inhibit it. And then the last one, and the newest technology we have is editing. So as I said, you can add back a functional or wild-type copy of a, of a mutated or missing gene. You can inhibit and activate or knock out a mutated or overexpressed gene that's functioning improperly. And then also, again, you can edit a mutated gene back, and you can also use editing to add stuff and take away. So editing is quite powerful. And one of the things I wanted to note, I don't know if you hear this a lot, but sometimes you'll hear scientists refer to wild type. If you hear that, it just means sort of the native or the natural, whatever is normally in you know, the consensus coding region, that's wild type. You'll also hear that about viruses. So what are the most common tools? There are actually many tools. There's about nine different ones, viral vectors, that I can show in other formats, but in 10 minutes you don't want to go over them. These are the main ones. So adeno-associated virus, which is a delivery vehicle and the cargo. A lentivirus, which is similar, delivery vehicle and cargo. These have pros and cons that need to be weighed, and we can talk about that at another time. The gene editing complex, which Amy's gonna cover. And I also wanted to mention mRNA, because some people call it gene therapy, and we're sort of splitting hairs here. But it's really more of a genetic therapy. It's not true gene therapy because the DNA is not staying in the cell. And this, by the way, is the lipid nanoparticle that you use to, um, to deliver mRNA. So it's also very different from a viral vector. So what makes a good candidate for gene therapy? The biggest thing is you're using a natural virus. That natural virus had a genome that was a certain size. We are limited by that. And so in the case of AV, you're limited to five kilobases. In the case of lentivirus, uh, you're limited to nine, so five and nine. And it's important to consider, and I'll show you an example in a second, that that's not just your transgene. That's the signals to turn it on, to turn it off, that sort of thing. But the most, the other really important questions are, can the delivery vehicle, vehicle infect and transfer material to your target cells? And the reason that's important is you know, maybe muscle is important for what you're doing, but what you really need to know, is it the satellite cell? Is it, you know, cardiomyocyte? Like, you have to know exactly the biology you're trying to fix, and if the virus can get there, or is it an adjacent type cell? So you have to get really down into the nitty gritty to understand if this is going to be tractable. Um, and, and finally, 
are the target cells amenable to this approach? And in some ways, this is most important in CNS or central nervous system associated diseases, where oftentimes you'll have sort of the average expression level and you'll have a disease phenotype if that is expressed too high or too low. And so that's what we call the Goldilocks, Goldilocks scenario, where you really have to be able to fine tune that expression to where it needs to be. And so that's another thing you really have to work out in your preclinical models. So for basic architecture, it looks like the virus. In the case of AV, these are the only viral pieces that are left. This is what's required to copy it and then put it in the viral package, the viral uh, capsid. You have an enhancer promoter, which is your start. You have your transgene, which is the gene um, that you're interested in. And then you have a poly A, which is essentially your stop signal. The next thing that you have to figure out is how to make AV. And so this is something that's been known for a long time, but we'll talk about this later. This is an incredibly costly endeavor, depending on how you do it, and something that the field is working on. But basically what you do is you introduce a series of plasma DNAs, you put them into a cell, you grow them up for about a week, and then you either centrifuge them or use chromatography to separate them from everything else. And at the end, you have a tube of trillions of viruses. Depending on the scale that you did this at, this tube could be worth you know, $20 million. So it, it's, it's very complicated and very expensive right now. Okay, so just to leave you some take-home messages, the keys to the recent successful gene therapy outcomes, solid, basic clinical science. The basic science has to be well understood, and the preclinical science has to be well understood. High unmet medical need is obviously very helpful when dealing with the FDA. You need to have good cellular and tissue target choices. And what's working well with, for us is that, all of us, is that the health authorities, especially the FDA, are understanding this platform and how to make this virus more and more as time goes on. So those conversations become much easier. But there are limitations that exist. It's expensive to make, it's difficult to make. Health authorities, especially around the world, have very stringent CMC requirements. Um, there are some safety concerns when you have very high dose delivery um, that we can talk about, but like for SMA, there were actually two children that died when they were given very, very high doses. So although, you know, if you look on the internet, it looks like a great success, and it was a great success. There are children that are walking, um, but for some, it wasn't a success. And so you have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about this. Uh, and the last is continued study of immunological reactions to gene therapy. Uh, and, and these are basically all the same. So, you know, gene therapy has a lot of potential to halt, treat, or cure disease, and I think it's really important to know that cure is not always what people say it is. It's really important that people will tell you that, and it means something different depending on if you're an insurance company, if you're a pharmaceutical company, if you're an academic. And so I would just caution you to, to be really careful when using that term. But what we do know is that people have received these, and people are walking, and people are seeing, and that these do have an effect. Every gene therapy strategy has pros and cons, and right now, manufacturing and reimbursement are expensive, and we're figuring that out, and that's gonna be important moving forward. And with that, um, I'll hand it over to Amy. Great, thanks, Matt. Well, look at that, I'm, I'm Amy Raymond. Um, like Matt, I work for a company who feels really strongly about giving us all time to go out and help the community. Like Matt, if ever I can be helpful, please reach out to me. Um, I may not know the answers, but I'll help you find them. So, on to gene editing. And I guess the font's a little small there, but I, I wanted to start at a baseline of what is gene editing, right? Because not that long ago, it sounded like something you would see on the Jetsons rather than something you would see in a clinical trial. Um, it's a method for introducing targeted genetic changes into your somatic cells. So not the cells that would be used for making your children. If you or your partner uh, were pregnant, the changes from gene editing would not be affecting the cells that give rise to your children. Um, but it is, it, it comes from a natural process where this is how bacteria had defended themselves for millennia against viral infections. So it's not purely invented by scientists. Um, you may be familiar with it from the 2020 Nobel Prize uh, for CRISPR-Cas9. It's the most common 
historically most common uh, gene editing program in the last few years. Uh, Matt referenced it on his own slides. Uh, it stands for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, which is why we say CRISPR. <laughs> um, and while we're all focused on what we can do for human health with it, please know that there's lots of other areas that are harnessing CRISPR for other purposes like veterinary sciences, like plant sciences. Um, but I'm, I'm personally very excited uh, about what we'll be doing with diagnostic testing in the world with this CRISPR. So just to sort of over, overstate it. Oh, sorry, I did, I did the same thing. Um, just to overstate it, it does not make changes uh, it, it only makes changes to your somatic cells, not to your germline. And I think that's a fair question everybody should be asking about consequences for any kind of gene editing program and what the intended targets are. All right, um, I won't spend too, too much time on it, but how does it work is a very fair question. So CRISPR, and this is sort of the canonical CRISPR-Cas, it works by these three parts coming together, right? You have the, the DNA represented here in, in gold and blue and red, and there's a complex of a protein that does work, so an enzyme, in this case, Cas, uh, that is partnered with the guide, the, the single-stranded guide. And these two come together, and that guide helps put the endonuclease, uh, the enzyme that's gonna do the work of the cutting, into the right place. It does a cutting on both strands of the DNA. Um, that's got its own inherent risks. Uh, we have, oh no, have lots of systems in our body for repairing that, but they aren't always perfectly perfect. Um, and in that way, making programmed DNA, uh, either an insertion or a point change, that sort of thing. And um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a marvel, right? I mean, it was really only described in the literature and. 2013, 2012, so in 10 years, we've gone from recognizing this is the immune system of bacteria to, oh my gosh, we could do things with it, to let's get it into clinical trials, following all of the important preclinical, non-clinical work that has to happen. Um, so that is the canonical CRISPR-Cas9, but what I'm excited about are the next generation of CRISPR treatments, which are, are headed into the clinic right now for clinical trials. And instead of using the, the typical Cas9 with its own inherent limitations, um, scientists spent some time while the technology was hung up in litigation trying to come up with, like, how would we improve upon this? And one of them is the other Cas. Cas just stands for CRISPR-associated protein because my people, the dorks, are good at a lot of things but not creative naming. <laughs> um, and so the evolution continues with these endonucleases, like the white blob there who's gonna do the cutting. And we've also started evolving the guides. Um, one company is very public about their Chardonnay. It's, it's a different kind of RNA guide that's a hybrid for both RNA and DNA. All of these different, all the different touch points of this entire system have an opportunity to be evolved and have some consequence in that evolution that people are, have been working on, non-clinical and preclinical. Um, but it's given rise to two additional kinds of gene editing, uh, base editing and prime editing, both of which were developed by the Broad Institute. Uh, you may have heard talks by Alex Bergen or this morning Jillian spoke, that same Broad Institute, where instead of having the risk of cutting two strands, base editing allows one strand to be cut, not both. It's a little bit safer. It does keep the rest of the system in context and, uh, and intact. Uh, likewise, prime editing, which is a little more search and replace. I won't go through the details, but they're, they're not identical. They have slightly different advantages and disadvantages in terms of where your intended target is for changing. Um, as much as I think this is exciting, it's not brandest, brandest new. Um, we have had other forms of gene editing technology like talons and so forth that went into trials, but they were very clunky and not very effective. Uh, this looks more recently at the, the CRISPR type of gene editing trials. So over the last handful of years, you see more and more trials each year. We're only halfway through 2013, that's why it's not bigger. Already having some sponsors on the books with um, CRISPR trials headed into the clinic next year. 
where are these technologies being used? Mostly oncology, right? And some of that is the ethics of what does that patient community stand to lose? Um, some of it is, well, there's a lot of dynamics behind why, why oncology gets the focus there. But more and more, we're seeing them in uh, malignant and non-malignant hematological disorders, but also metabolic, but also, but also, but also. Um, I, I cut it off, but there's a lot of different indication groups that have one team or another working on gene editing programs for them. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, you know, the, the question that I would be wondering if I sat in your seat was like, well, what's the experience of being in this trial? What's the experience of going through that treatment? Likewise, you know, what does it mean for your community if you're about to invest in one of these technologies? What does that look like? So I just wanted to say a couple of words about the two different modalities. Matt helpfully touched on AAV versus lentiviral vectors for gene therapy, and those have you know, the two different ways of working historically. Uh, in vivo means you know, directly into the body, so you're, you're doing something into a viral vector or uh, a non-viral, like a lipid nanoparticle, and going straight to the person. Other end of the spectrum is ex vivo, where you have to take cells out of the patient and then do the changes to those cells, and there's a lot that goes on there in terms of manufacture, in terms of uh, who's a great candidate, and then return those now edited or uh, changed in some way cells to the patient. And there's a huge difference there in terms of um, how much you can produce all at once. Something like this, uh, you can make the whole bolus of it. It's a $20 million tube, as Matt said, or more but you're making it all at once. Here, you're making it for each patient with their own cells, which means that patient's going through all kinds of things, potentially mobilization, certainly hospitalization, certainly uh, additional layers of immune suppression. Um, things to keep in mind as you explore these technologies for your own community. But uh, overall, like what, some of the messages I wanna leave you with, um, CRISPR, has given rise to many additional new generation of derivatives, but if you're exploring this for your own community, just as with gene therapy, there isn't just one way of doing it, there's these at least two different kinds of vectors, uh, you really have to think about it from what is the specific technology that's being uh, explored in that case, what is the CRISPR? Um, and you have to look at it for the indication-specific evaluation. Uh, you know, is that gene amenable to that kind of a, a treatment? So we, we do see a lot that still happens in viral vectors, but the, the evolution of these lipid nanoparticles has made them uh, much more attractive, and we're seeing more and more of that, especially for direct in vivo treatment. Um, I expect to see this branching out into a lot of different directions across the rare uh, Uber community. And something to keep in mind uh, is that each of these come with the gene editing, comes with a mandatory 15-year long-term follow-up. Mandatory from the regulators to the drug development company, not necessarily to you, but we do typically ask people at the front end, would you be willing to be part of this 15-year long-term follow-up? And that's a big commitment, um, but it's, it's also a big commitment to consider having your own genes changed, right? Um, this year, we have the very first PDUFA for a gene editing program, We the World. Uh, so this could be the year that we see the first gene editing treatment as part of the standard of care for sickle cell disease. Um, another, another disease, beta thalassemia, will have their PDUFA in the spring. So that was the original CRISPR-Cas, and we expect to see more and more of these coming through the system. I do want to leave you with a couple of additional resources in addition to Matt, in addition to me. Um, in the event that you're able to download the slides that later Michelle thought you might be, uh, these are additional really great um, resources for exploring these concepts. So if, if you were with us for the sessions yesterday, we've now made it from the one end of the spectrum starting with small molecules now to the therapies that you would describe as the most precise, the most elegant, one-time administration theoretically, and potentially curative. It's not a word either of you used, mm -mm. and maybe we can start there. Why, why didn't you use those terms? 
I actually see sponsors, drug developers, use that word. I see them use it on their website. I see them use it in all kinds of places. But I couldn't agree more with Matt. What does that word mean to each person? If it means relief of symptoms, that could be. Does it mean relief of symptoms forever? Does it mean relief of symptoms and no other problems? I think only time can tell with each of those treatments. And saying it before you have the data doesn't seem reasonable to me. I would add we also have a lot to learn clinically before we can say that. Um, in the case of AAV, it's dependent upon your cell staying alive and retaining that DNA. So if you treat a child, let's say four, by the time they're 12, they've turned over most of those cells. So although you helped them get to you know, their adolescence and possibly adulthood, you didn't cure them for life. Whereas if you treat someone that's 60, maybe it is with them for life. So I think we have to really think about the definition and then also understand how to make these things long-term for everybody. So this is the function of having adults in the room. And I know a lot of people get very excited about these technologies. I think one of the things in the session that follows when we have uh, a woman from the SMA Foundation who has seen different types of modalities come to market um, they're now focused on regenerative therapies because even if you use a gene therapy and you eliminated the disease, the process of the disease, you're still freezing the patient where they are and on a progressive degenerative disease that means what you've lost is lost. Um, but l let's take a step back. We we've now seen these first gene therapies come to market. You, you mentioned that the sickle cell disease could have an approval this year. Where are we in terms of the development of these therapies and, and how far have we progressed and you know, what can we do, what can't we do? I mean, I think we've learned a lot sort of on two different fronts. The first being just the basic science. We know these things work. So even, I think, 15 years ago when these trials were starting, there was still a question, would any of this work? Even though we knew they went to the liver and we knew they delivered a gene, and now, right, like I said, you have children walking you have people that have not had to get um, blood infusions for years. Um, so that's a real positive. I think on the pragmatic side, you know, the FDA is understanding more that a typical approach does not work for not only rare diseases, but for gene therapies, that you have to be a little bit flexible in how you bring these things to market. I think that's also real progress. I think, though, on the other side of that, as these things become available, we have to work with payers to, to figure out how to make sure everyone can access this. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it just sits in a freezer and that's not useful. How about on gene editing? Um, so gene editing, I think that we're at the very front end of that curve is really where I think we are, right? Where we're having the very first programs, they may not have been the first ones to start, but the first ones to reach that place where they're asking for approval, marketing authorization to become part of the standard of care, coupled with um, this is the year that I'm seeing so many different new next generation versions of this gene editing all moving into clinical trials. Um, so I think that it's the very front end of a steep curve um, that is going to have a lot of different technologies available. And what I love in that concept is that we'll, by using a variety of different approaches, be learning about how better to refine it over time. Each of you touched a, a little on the limits of these approaches as we stand today, but where do you see the challenges? Are, are they in terms of delivery, in terms of the choice of vectors? What needs to be done additionally to make it a, a broaderly, a, a more applicable therapy? Mm -hmm. um, I think the reason it isn't perfectly applicable in every case is going to be such a wide range of reasons, right? I think that there are barriers potentially at every single step, all the way back to the preclinical, the nonclinical. Um, there's also, you know, is it effective? But does it not cause other problems, which I think is a real, real issue. Um, again, I agree with Matt that how far that the, the health authorities have come in terms of understanding it, that's no longer a barrier. But uh, the approval process and the endpoints that have to be used, even, even when you have a new technology, you still have those challenges as a community. How is it being measured to show that it is better than not doing the treatment coupled with access? 
So I would say that viral vectors in general, one of the things that's really good about them is they've evolved over millions of years to sneak into your body and deposit something in your cell. And so they're very good about that. That's also sort of the downside because they're very good at doing that for what they want to do, not what we want them to do. And so we're trying in, let's say, a year, two years to modify 20 million years of evolution. And so I think that's one limitation that we have is sort of we've been able to treat a certain amount of disease that were sort of low-hanging fruit, to put it maybe pejoratively. And when we're getting to more complicated diseases, we're going to need more precise vectors that go exactly where we need them to go. And we're going to need to figure out how to harness current technology to enable that. And again, working against the viral sort of innate desire to do something is not trivial to do. And I think the other that I think we've both sort of touched upon is manufacturing. Not only just in general making these things, but as we continue to modify, that continues to change how we have to make them. And so we're sort of constantly battling this um, because you need to make, you know, for one person, let's say, 100 trillion particles. And then you have to do that, you know, for however many people in a trial. So you're looking at a, at a lot of money, but that's not helpful when people all around the world have these diseases. So we have to really get that part figured out as well. Given the, the problem of immunogenicity and other limits of viral vectors, do you, do you see us moving beyond viral vectors? So it's a really good question. And um, I've thought about this a lot. So one, I'll admit I'm really biased because my PhD is in virology and I'm a huge nerd about viruses. But what I like to think is if we're going to do that, we should think about what are the positives from viruses and can we apply that to something new? So the, the positive, right, is kind of like I just mentioned. It sneaks in for the most part and it deposits DNA. And to my understanding, we don't really have another technology that does that. Everything else is transient. It does mm -hmm. it for a little bit. And so those are the two things we have to figure out how to port over to something else. So if that's possible, I think it's great. And I think we should always consider new technologies and be pushing the envelope. But I think the other thing that we have to our advantage now, uh, and I'm quite hopeful for, but maybe, maybe just being a dreamer, is that with machine learning and with AI, not only can we evolve the capsids that we have, the delivery vehicles that we have, but I really think we're going to be able to make new ones. Mm -hmm. And so rather than trying to fight against 20 million years of evolution, we just can start fresh with what we know from other viruses and pick the parts we like. And I think that will become possible. My dream scenario is that there won't be one way we do it, right? Depends on what is the, the underlying pathology. I, again, the example of is it, is it that you have a mutation in your gene that means you don't ever create a functional version of that protein, then a replacement can be a really wonderful solution. But depending on the basis of the, the pathology, I think that we should have different tools that bear the minimum risk in each case. I think that's where I would like to see us get so that every kind of pathology and every kind of community has more than one option available. So, so Matt, use the term transients, people may think of these therapeutic approaches as almost one and the same, but th there is a significant difference and that is that with a gene replacement, you're not really replacing it so much as you're getting it into the, the cell machinery where it can produce a needed protein. In, in the case of gene editors, it's integrating. And the consequence of that is that you want a vector that drops off its payload and goes away. Mm -hmm. You want one that may hang around and get to get into more cells and more cells. And mm -hmm. So how do you think about vectors and do you think about it differently because of that than Matt might? I bet I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I bet I do. I think, I think of it a little bit like um, if what you really needed was a fish, having somebody give you that fish in the form of the gene replacement, something that is continuing to make the wild type version of your gene in the cell is super helpful. Um, but in terms of durability, I think that you're gonna wanna learn to fish, right? You're gonna need that permanent change. Um, that is where I think that a lot of programs would be headed. Yeah, and for me, it comes down to the biology. So 
let's say you have a, um, a disease that has what we call a sink effect, or maybe one cell can help a lot of the cells around it. Well, then maybe you, maybe AV replacement is, is good for that. Mm -hmm. But if you can reach all of your cells, I would highly recommend gene editing for specific diseases. I think it's really important for everyone here to consider all of the modalities that are out there and weigh the pros and cons, because that's sort of what you're gonna see is that none of them are perfect, none of them are gonna give you everything you want, but some might be better than others. And, and keep up, right, because gene editing, I don't know, five, six years ago, just personally, I wouldn't have thought we'd be where we are, and it's been incredible. Yeah. So even annually, I think, leaps and bounds are made. I feel like I should be embarrassed by how long I thought it would take us to get to this place. Certainly well more than 10, 15 years. Well, one of the big concerns and one of the, the things that slow us down in getting these therapies to patients is safety mm -hmm. concerns. How good are we at predicting the safety of these therapies before they're in humans? And are there things we can do to improve that and accelerate that? Well, that's a really complex question. I'd love to have a crack at it first because how good are we at it? I think the answer is not that great. I think that um, it's still a necessary, helpful first step when we do use that approach. Um, I can point to high profile programs in the last year or two where everything's been going great in the humans, but, but their animal model later presented a, a tumor and so, I mean, there's the prime example of, it looked like it was going to be fine until we went into it, and then you can see it, even the animal model wound up with some trouble. Um, I think that when it comes to gene editing, the, the first time I put one of these programs together for gene editing, I, I did what we all do, which is like, okay, how did everybody else do this? I uh, start looking at other programs, and I, I wanted to know, like, how do you find off-target effects? How do you find mutations that you didn't intend? Like, what are the systems that they're using to do that? And the answer is nothing. None of these gene editing programs are looking at the whole genome. And were it my child, um, I would want that. And it's not where we're at yet for technology. It's not really, it's not considered feasible to do that whole genome sequencing before the treatment and after the treatment, partly because that's a lot of data that has to be sorted and parsed meaningfully to the patient family. I think that's, that's one of the barriers. Yeah, I, I agree with you that we're not where we ought to be. I think part of the reason for that is we lack good basic models to look at this before we get to human trials. Mm -hmm. So people use mice all the time. The mouse immune system is vastly different from ours. Um, and if you talk to, I don't know if there's any immunologist here, but if you run into one, they will most likely agree with me on just some basic levels. The other thing is if you keep a mouse alive long enough, it develops tumors, just a normal mouse. Um, and so just from those aspects, they're not really great. The next best ones are rat and rabbit and dog, but those experiments are really difficult and they're still not a human. The next one is non-human primate or monkey, and those are better, but they still haven't been very predictive. And so what we really need, I think, are good models to help us understand or be predictive of what's gonna happen in a human. I, I would add, though, that there are some new tools that are coming out that, at least for AV, are helpful. So obviously we have all of the you know, uh, monoclonal antibodies and all kinds of small molecules that people have been using for years. Um, but there are some being, that have been developed that are being used for AV that work for neutralizing antibodies. Um, and there's, I'm trying to remember what the other one is. Hmm. I'm forgetting what the other one is. But there are some new technologies that are coming out that are also sort of looking at this. But they're more reactionary, not proactive. And we really need to be proactive. You both talked about the need to choose the right tool for the job. But there is enormous interest in platform approaches. We, we had the FDA yesterday, uh, one of the women who heads one of the new offices there talking about creating a platform designation. Um, and we've talked about platform in the context of out of one therapies and having these type of plug and play models, but as people developing therapies, what would that mean even for larger indications from a, a cost and time point of view and your ability to get these therapies to patients faster? So I think we're not quite there yet. But I'm hopeful that we will. And the reason I say that is 
my view is that we are at the spot, at least in gene replacement, of where monoclonal antibodies were about 20, 30 years ago. And when they first started, it was so expensive, they didn't know how to make it. And now it's just like, you see, all the commercials you see on TV are for monoclonal antibodies because it's so run of the mill nowadays. And so I think we're sort of at the, what we've been calling uh, the end of the beginning, where it works, we have an idea of how to do this, and now we have to get to this plug and play model. And I'm hopeful that, placing a lot of bets on AI and machine learning, but I'm hopeful that using a lot of data will be helpful. And I say that because you're putting 5,000 bases or 30,000 bases into a viral particle and trying to understand how it interacts with itself with the viral particle and all these other things. And you can't do that one at a time. You need to have something that lets you look at big data sets. And I'm, I'm hoping that will be possible. So we've got about two minutes left. And as we ask the audience if there are any questions, I'm going to ask you just to tell them if you want to go to someone. But what can people who want to see a gene therapy or gene editing therapy develop for their disease group, what can they do to get the attention of someone like you? Uh, I think the most important thing is to organize your community, uh, have good natural history and registry. It's hard to do both of those. I think uh, a network of researchers in your space uh, who work together or in the very least don't fight against each other are all different versions of de-risking it. Um, but you know, I think it's, it's that combination of do we understand the biology and how well organized is the community in terms of risk from the budget and timeline perspective. Yeah, I would sum up clear biology. If you know a biomarker, that's incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. Know how many patients you have. Those three things will get attention. Yep. There's a question in the back. Hi, yes, my name is Kathy. I'm with the Amyloidosis Foundation. Um, we recently had a lot of success with the CRISPR-Cas9 and yeah. the um, NTLA-2001. Um, our community is really excited about it. However, I think one of the challenges is going to be, um, and, and this isn't just with us, this is with all the rare disease communities, is that you, you need a substantial larger um, size to, to test. Um, because of our rare diseases and the fact that we don't have a lot of people. Uh, how, how do you plan on meeting that challenge? Some of it is a statistics challenge, but some of it is a regulator challenge, right? I think that the way to address that is it'll be different answers for different elements of those challenges. Um, but I think that it becomes a, a question of what are we comparing the results to in a gene editing trial? Is it relative to a placebo control in that same trial, or do we have some robust longitudinal data that can be the basis of comparison? I think those kinds of not sexy but super effective steps in the front end can make a big difference. So the boss is telling me to wrap. If you had a question you didn't get to ask, please just grab Amy or, or grab Matt coming down the ramp. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you.